alien invasion. Is it biblical? Of course it is. Clearly I'm not here today as a fact witness. You can Google it. I think you just use the Bible, do whatever the hell you like. Just remember, it's not a lie if you believe it. Welcome to Mystery Bible Theater 3000. My name is Caleb Hegg. With me, of course, my lovely assistant, Rob Van Hoff. What's up, my guy? How you doing? Doing well. Your voice is really low. My mall. voice is really low. Well, not to the people out in, okay, in, I can internet, in internet land. I don't know what to tell you. Sorry, man. Um, okay. So, today... We're gonna do it. So I looked in our, <coughs> I looked in our mystery Bible theater three thousand folder. Give me just a second. <laughs> and uh, who was there? But it was just like Stephanie, 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 like all these emails, right? <laughs> so I chose one that was not from Stephanie, um, and that's what we're gonna be reviewing today. Now this is a short one. This could be a very quick. I mean, this video. Okay. Let's just let's just roll. Maybe we should just play it and then we'll talk about it. Sound good? Before we do, seehagatorresource.com. That's where you can send videos. We thank everyone who sends them in, whether or not we uh, end up reviewing them or not. I got just a folder ton of a, a, a ton of emails in a folder. Most of them probably won't be used. Okay, so even though we have a ton, most of them probably won't be used. So don't be shy. Find your videos. Send them on in. Okay. Also, uh, don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. I know it sounds weird, but it really does help us. If you're already subscribed, go ahead and give this video a like. That helps us as well. We are on our way to 10,000 subscribers, and we thank every single one of you for clicking that subscribe button. All right, so we're going to kick over here. Let me first make sure that I got my, oops, got my video uh, keyed up, which I do. Let's go ahead and come right over here. All right, now uh, Rob can't see this. It's not going to make a bit of difference, uh, but just so Rob knows where we're at, this uh, gentleman has, has a, bi a Bible open on a desk. Looks, to, It sounds to me, looks to me like this might be a, he could be a King James only, I don't know. Anyway, uh, he's got a couple of places highlighted. We're looking at 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 and 5, and this is what he is going to say. I want to show you how the devil perverts the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 4, the devil actually changes the Bible to take away the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you look at all the mainstream versions like the ESV, notice it says in the name of the Lord Jesus, deleting Christ. It does the same thing at the end, the power of our Lord Jesus, deleting Christ. The next verse it talks about the day of the Lord, but the Bible says the day of the Lord Jesus. It's Jesus that's coming back. He has all power. It's his name that is above all name. Oh, they have a footnote. Some manuscripts add Jesus. Isn't it interesting? All the Catholic heretical manuscripts delete the name and power of Jesus. That is the power and the working of Satan. Yea, hath God said, if he can just delete parts of the Bible, they can change things. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm really not laughing. I, okay, I'm laughing. I'm sorry. It's just, it's it's so interesting. So there's so many things here. First of all, if Satan was trying to delete the name of the Lord Jesus from the apostolic scriptures as the New Testament, then why would he just do it in verses 4 and 5 of 1 Corinthians 5? Five. Why wouldn't he do it throughout the entire book? Like, what? <laughs> I just don't understand. Second of all, he, say, he says the Catholic manuscripts, the Catholic manuscripts are trying to delete it, but the ESV is using older manuscripts. It, the standardized text is what the King James Version is using. I... I, yeah, I, I'm wow. just so confused. <laughs> There's so many questions here. Um, like I said, I don't think this will be a long one. But Rob, would you like to comment before I go on? 
Well, I just wanted to do a quick, I wanted to try something here real yeah, quick. Please. So he, his claim is that in, in, this is first Corinthians, is that right? Yeah. Five. Yeah. First Corinthians okay. five versus four so, and five. Yeah. So if we, I just thought, well, how many times does the word Christ occur in first Corinthians? Well, right. according to accordance, 52 times. Right. Hey, can, can we like just it's, pause? It's, it's chapter one, verse one. Paul called an apostle of Jesus Christ. So can we just pause real quick, real quick on this? Because we, like we should. 52 we should, times. We should clarify. No, th- sorry, 59 occurrences in 52 verses. That's, that's there you go. Almost 60 times. So let's just pause real quick. For, let's. Let's pretend that somebody has stumbled on this YouTube channel. Maybe you are a Bible-believing Christian, but haven't done any studying. Let's pretend that maybe you go to church every Sunday, and uh, you know, I, I actually had a friend who was like this. Go to, he goes to church every Sunday, grew up in the church, um, and and even teaches Sunday school from time to time. We were this was probably it had to be at least four years ago because I we were having a beer together. And uh, I was mentioning something about, you know, uh, Bible literacy. And I say, you know, if you ask m- most Christians, what is Jesus' last name? And I paused. And my friend, Sunday school teacher and all, uh, looked at me and he said, Christ. And so, uh, just so we're clear here, and I don't know if this gentleman knows this or not. Christ is not actually part of Jesus or Yeshua's name. Christ is the... uh, It's a title. It's a title. It's an English translation of the word Christos, which simply means Messiah or anointed one. It's not his last name. It's not part of his name. So there was a Simpsons movie where uh, Ned, is it Land? Who's the name? Flanders, Ned Flanders. He's talking to his boys because they think the end of the world. He's like, okay, boys, when you meet Jesus, be sure to call, be sure to say Mr. Mr. Christ. Christ. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, I'm not trying to be rude here to uh, whether or not this, whether or not this gentleman knows it or not, Christ is not actually part of, of Jesus's name or Yeshua's name or whatever you want to say. It's not part of his name. It's a title. And so when he says he's, Satan's trying to delete the name of, of Christ or the name of Jesus in verse four. This is like, he's off to think that there are people that are looking to this man for like any kind of guidance to help understand the word of God is, is really crazy. Is it true that, would, would you say this is fair that the way that real hardcore Catholics point to the Septuagint or, or no, sorry, I misspoke point to the Latin Vulgate that King James only point to the King James version. Oh, you... absolutely. 100%. And here's the thing, you know, I've been, I've, okay, maybe this is the rabbit trail that'll take us into a 30 minute show. You know, I've been thinking uh, recently, I've been, I watched a, uh, a documentary on, uh, it was a three part docu- documentary series on um, these, these Catholic monks. Okay. And um, this particular brand of Catholic monk is very dedicated to silence. So in this particular documentary, it's it's documenting a Catholic monastery in uh, South Korea. It's the only one of its kind in, in Korea. And um, they, they only talk. There's 11 monks at this monastery. I'm getting somewhere with this, by the way. Trust me, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Uh, there's 11 monks at this monastery, and they only talk to each other. Um, once a week on a walk, and then they talk to each other uh, once a week during a meal. There's one meal that they all share together, and they, and they talk together. I think it's on Sunday is, is when they share this meal together, and they're allowed to talk then. Besides that, they don't talk. There's no talking. And uh, they're, they're interviewing these guys, you know, and, and kind of talking about how, how all this stuff works. And the, and the gentlemen are, are uh, relating how they've come to Christ and how they've, why they've made their dedication to, to, to God. And I was watching it, and I just thought, man, these guys, they are so fervent in their belief. They, they really want to please God. Now, granted, they are way off, right? 
they they pray to Mary. They have their theology is hor- horrific. Uh, it's I think it's a sin to to. Well, it's like the Essenes. I mean, you could yeah. find or the Pharisees or the right. you know. I mean, it, they cloister themselves off. <clears throat> they don't get married. They uh, you know they. They're they're cut off from the world, which I mean, this is this is not what the the Bible tells us to do. But there's a piece of me that really says, well, does God forgive the the bad theology? Like, does He forgive the idolatry? Does He for? And and the thing is, is this gentleman might be way off, but this probably comes from teachers. He's getting this on, you know, the guy that we're watching right now, he, he's getting this off the internet somewhere, or he's, you know, in his mind, he is 100% justified in this. It honestly makes me sad. It makes me sad because I, well, I don't understand blaming Catholics for, for a Protestant translation. Like, <laughs> exactly. you know what I mean? Yes. Like he's, 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 it's like, if you have the King James and the ESV, which one is Catholic? Like which one is is more, more Catholic? Catholic? It's going right. to be the King James. Yeah, I mean, course. they even have the apocrypha. Right now, it's true that the ESV has been endorsed by the Catholic Church with specific. They published a list of modifications, but they sure. basically are, which is crazy in itself. But but they have the power to do that, right, Rob? But this is but this is a but the, but the ESV at its root, deepest roots, is a. Is a Protestant, Protestant translation, yeah, yeah. Product, yeah. I, I guess my point is just this: I, I, you know, I, I, I think that people probably see this show, they've never heard of us, they don't know who we are, and they probably see us like the Mystery Bible Theater three thousand. They're like, why do I even care? Well, and, and not only that, but they're they're probably like, man, these guys, all they do is dig on people. And the thing is, is I don't want people to think that you know there is a there is a piece of me that just longs for uh you know for people to come to truth and to understand and praise the lord i was thinking of this this morning during my my because this documentary has really been on my mind and, and i was thinking of this while i was praying this morning that uh i'm so grateful that it is not up to me who you know who's in covenant relationship with god and who's not that is up to the Lord himself. And the Holy One is the one who has to determine that. Praise the Lord, because I am at a loss. I'm at a loss even when it comes to determining sometimes who we should call brother and who we should not. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. I hear you. You know, when it comes to like monks and, and these kinds, you know, in the in the Greek Orthodox, obviously they have uh, monasteries also. In One thing that it makes me think of is people need healing, Right. And they've identified, you know, there's just, the world is crazy and I need, I feel like I just need, you know, we all need rest. I mean, Shabbat is is about rest, but I think people come from real traumatic and, and, and situations where they've, you know, it, it like it, it's actually probably a good thing for them to have a time where they get out and, and like try to heal. You know, and so I'm I'm okay with the therapeutic. I could see therapeutic benefit for people going and saying, "Hey, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I think you know, all go of to us this place all, and have solitude, and sure. I'm not gonna talk for a week." Hey, good on you, man. All you of know, us, pray, all of us need that, work. right? Especially those of us with kids. We all need it. We all need to get away, right? But here's, but here's the thing: is that, and and one of the things that this documentary did uh, kind of open my eyes to is, I I believe. Now that there is a, an, there is a different motive for the monastic life. These guys honestly believe that they, in in the solitude they are able to connect with all the souls of humankind, and that their prayer is actually saving the world, like the course of the world, and that all the monasteries around the world, their prayers together are coming together and steering the course of the world. It, I will say this, it has made me... Uh, Kabbalists are doing the same. The, the e- ultra... E- exactly. Kabbalists have the same idea, except they have completely different rules and worldview. Exactly. Yep. They believe that they are... Um, I mean, that's the whole rationale of why in the state of Israel, the ultra-Orthodox are exempt from military service, because they're... The way they... And they cloister themselves off. Right. And... And they 
their work is evaluated or valued as more important than physical military training. So, I, so I, I mean, two things on that. Number one, I think that the way that is that both the Catholics and the Kabbalists are going about this, I think that there's a mystical side to this belief that is that is not only wrong, but I think it might be detrimental, obviously. Well, yeah. yeah but, but, however, I will say this, the prayer of a righteous man does much, right? So, I mean, there. I think that one of the things that we as evangelicals and Protestants have done is possibly, not all the time, but possibly downgraded the importance of prayer and the way that it works in this world, right? So we're way off, by the way. We're, this is a total co- different conversation, which is totally fine. But ultimately, I think that as as evangelicals or whatever you want to say, pronomian Christians, how, like however you want to classify us, Torah observant believers, whole Bible Christians, what, like whatever, like... I think that there is a you know once once you detach from uh, the majority of messianic uh, faith, which I would say is is predominantly um, charismatic. Once you know if you are detached from the charismatic side, because I think the charismatics tend to uh, be closer to this theology, the idea that, that that prayer really does affect things. But I think the farther you get away from that charismatic evangelical side of things. Uh, the farther you get away from the idea that my my prayer really does something, and I think that is detrimental. I think that that we should view our prayer as doing something very important because the Bible says that it does something very important, and so um, it's it is a balance, man. It's a, it's something that uh, I think that we need to to uh, ponder and, and and meditate on. When it comes to this video, though, that we have viewed, there's just so much wrong with it that. Uh, it, it, and honestly, I wonder, like, why would you even make a video like this? Does he? Does the? Does the person talking? He seems really uptight, uh, <laughs> and, and but also uneducated. You know what I mean? Oh, and when I say yeah. uneducated, I know that can sound like <laughs> demeaning or dismiss. I, what I'm trying to say is like, there's actually, you know, there's a reason why, like, when they publish the the Greek New Testament and they give you that the. Uh, the apparatus it's not a conspiracy they they are trying to make a tool right that yes. equips that best best informs the the greek reader as to all you know the best manuscript traditions and it's true that the main text is that is they they might choose oh you know we're not going to put the word christos here right in first corinthians 5 or whatever however guaranteed if you have if you have just right. a, a, a New Testament with the apparatus, it'll tell you here's are, here are the manuscripts that have Christ, and here's the ones that don't. And yeah, so, so it's all on the, it's all what do you call it on the table, or it's all uh, uh, yeah, it's all all it's, the books are open. Yeah, Nobody's like trying to hide anything. But he's he's he seems to be like like. Worked up well, about to, a about a to, to a person a, who only reads a, a, a war that doesn't exist to a person who only reads their their English Bible and doesn't doesn't utilize the tools. This is probably what what is thought. However, here's here's the other thing. Most of the time, I would say that your translators of Bibles are trying to get to are, are, are they have a goal in mind that goal. I don't think that the goal is I'm going to hide the Bible from people or I'm going exactly. to manipulate. Exactly. They're investing their life in getting the Bible. The only time that I think that there is a major misstep in Bible translation is when somebody doesn't translate it. In other words, I'm going to rip off somebody else's, and we see this with like the Et Sefer and, and other translations. I'm going to oh, rip probably. off somebody else's translation, and then I'm going to insert my own two cents here, there, and, you know, uh, sprinkle it in a couple of places just to manipulate the text so that I can put my own theological bent on it. The fact of the matter is, is that no matter what translation you're reading, and if you, it's a real translation from a person, they're actually translating from the original languages into English, or whether or not it's a committee, and they're doing the same thing, they're translating from the original languages into English. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that there is going to be bias. No matter what, there is, which is one of the which is one of the reasons that we are so grateful that the Reformation has taken place and that we have multiple translations today. If you are an, an English reader who does oh, not, golly, have, if we went, if we had just if, if, without the Reformation, of course, it wouldn't. That's a hypothetical history, but right. We, 
Where oh would we my. be today? And and here, here here's the thing though is that if you're just an English reader who does not ha- have any knowledge of Hebrew or Greek, you are still at a major major advantage compared to the people before the Reformation. And the reason why is because I can open up five, 10, 15 different translations, English translations, and I can see all of the English translators' biases in one particular verse and see how much they differ. And then I can say, then I can go to an apparatus and say, well, why did they make these choices? I don't even have to know a lick of the original languages, and I still can get way farther than people who were around in the 1300s. All they, all they had was a priest telling them what the, what the, uh, you know, the Vulgate said. That was it. So yeah, and the, and it what the the doctrine of justification by faith, like where was that? Right. Where was you know it's, yeah it's. But however, it's important. I I mean it's I I see this as uh, you know conspiracy theory. People are scared, and what tends to happen is people realize something, and the the go to is always in the in the Torah movement. It's always that the Torah is for Jew and Gentile alike, and that we should be keeping it today. And what happens is people come to this realization, they see it in Scripture, all of a sudden it just it pops out, it's as clear as day, and they feel lied to. They feel lied to by their pastors, they feel lied to by the church, they feel lied to by history, right? Throughout The people throughout history that have taught this, taught against the Torah, and they say, well, if they, if they were wrong about the Torah, then they must be wrong about everything. And, and you start getting these really weird doctrines. Here's the thing. I honestly do not believe that anyone sat around, even in the second century, and said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make it so God's people don't follow God anymore. We're going to tell them that the Torah has been done away with. Ha, 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 ha. That's not how it worked, right? There is a, there is a theological progression that comes about. People were taught by their teachers, They're, you know, and they taught people after them. Until right. you come and you, to and you have persecution, you have right. top down from the persecution side imposing differences between Jews and others. Right. You have uh, the spread of the gospel, praise God, but you have a, I mean, for how many, it was 200 years. I mean, persecution was, it, um, it limited, and this is all in God's wisdom. It's not like, you know, uh, but it, it limited. Uh, people's grasp on the whole picture, but the seed of the gospel truly what did get spread out, and, hey, and that is good. How quick we are to judge, too. You know, here's the thing: is that I I think about persecution. I've never experienced real like physical pre- persecution for my faith ever, and I don't know if I ever will. But the thing is, is that I talk to my kids about persecution. We read about persecution. The fact of the matter is, is that I don't think that we can judge other people until we're put in the place where our children are going to be slaughtered in front of us. It, uh, to, to me, that is something that we, I don't know if you can ever prepare for. And when, it, when, we're fa- when a person is faced with that, you know, I would like to say that God would strengthen me and I would be able to stand in the, the, the test. But the truth of the matter is, is that until we are there, I don't. I, it's hard for me to judge someone who decides that they're going to, uh, you know, become lax on certain things because they don't want to see their kids slaughtered in front of them. Uh, I, you know, that's that's just real talk. I, I think that so many people say, "Well, you know, I'd be able to. I'd be able to stand up in, in the face of persecution." You know, the the stories of people boiling children in oil in front of their mothers is uh, it's horrific it's, it's uh, and i don't i mean it's something that i can't even comprehend so anyway um yeah back back to this video i it feels like the guy's upset about all the wrong things you know it's right. like um he's got a zeal but it's not according to knowledge it it really isn't and yep yeah I think that uh, I think that it's good for us to have zeal for the Lord and for His Word, but uh, I don't Amen. know if it should manifest in things like uh, nit- nitpicking translations to this degree. I, 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 and not only that, but I just think he's wrong. I mean, well, and attributing this to Satan, right? Yeah, exactly. He's saying it's Satan that wanted to get. Well, like, how effective 
if the name of, of Jesus, of Yeshua, is the name by which people will be saved, <laughs> does Christ have to be mentioned every time? Do we need to go through the New Testament and make sure we put Christ next to every time it says Jesus? And if it's if it's not there, is that because Satan wiped it out? I it's it's ungrounded. It it's ungrounded, it's incoherent. And I I hope this guy comes to his senses, you know, and sobers up with respect to the word of God. All right. That's gonna do it for this week. We will be back, Lord willing. On Wednesday for our normal show, 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time uh, on YouTube. And you can always check out our show on uh, any podcast format that you uh, so desire. And uh, yeah, we're here Fridays, 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time. Well, I mean, it's pre-recorded, but Pacific Time is when it airs. Mystery Bible Theater 3000. We will see you in the next episode.